Hello everyone and welcome back to mass media or electronic media depending on which school you are attending and this is class two and we are very loosely going in chronological order and uh, that means that newspapers came first they've been around for thousands of years magazines also print but now of course both are electronic and magazines have been around for hundreds of years and uh, after that, we will move into motion pictures, which have been around for 130 years or so, and on through radio and television and recording, music, and uh, the Internet, all that. So it's loosely, the textbook's kind of like that too, but loosely chronological. So that brings us up to our second topic, and they are both part of the journalism umbrella for uh, the most part, and they both began as print uh, medias, and now are, for a large section, are electronic. So let's go back, not too far, really, um, to uh, the 1820s and our very first general interest magazine. There are lots of specialty magazines uh, 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 scientific uh, and entertainment and all of that, cats and cigars and whatever. Um, but as a general interest magazine, we go back to the 1820s and the Saturday Evening Post. And uh, as a general interest magazine, it was aimed at a large audience. And uh, this is from the 1920s. And the illustration is by Norman Rockwell. I just like to point this out. And look, there's Scott Fitzgerald. I have Scott Fitzgerald and so on. Um, and uh, you might have heard that George Lucas has decided to build his Museum of Narrative Art, I think it is. And he has a rather large Norman Rockwell collection. Norman Rockwell is the illustrator. I'm very excited to uh, see that. It's going to be... Uh, near the Museum of Science and Industry and all of that, uh, near the Colosseum. So just as a side point, founded by Benjamin Franklin, there we go, and uh, back in the 20s, it was only a nickel, and the Saturday Evening Post. Okay, let's move on. And in 1879, we have the Postal Act of 1879, of course, uh, and this is important because this is an example of the government stepping in to help an industry. Okay, so we had phone deregulation, and that helped the internet, and, and so on. We have this uh, through our history, and the government coming in, and they can either regulate or back off um, and help out a little bit. So here in the Postal Act, they made sending magazines through the mail and newspapers through the mail cheaper than like a letter. So if you were going to write a, a, a letter and put it in an envelope, maybe a birthday card to somebody, um, then it's going to cost, uh, I don't know, what is it, 50, 55 cents, something like that for a first class stamp. And a magazine or a newspaper are uh, much bigger than a, uh, than a letter, but they cost a lot less to send through the mail. And so they are, they have a special consideration. They are not based on that same kind of weight. And it's a nice example of the government stepping in. And like I say, they're going to step in many times uh, through the years to either help out or regulate um, various media, uh, various media industries. 1900s, we talked about this uh, just in our last class. This this is the, uh, the, the, the mirror of the uh, yellow journalism and the yellow press around the same time, the 1900s. Remember we talked about um, William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer. Here in the magazine world, we have uh, muckrakers. They are named by President Teddy Roosevelt, and he said uh, they're just going through the muck and so on. Even though he was a progressive, he just wasn't real crazy about the way the magazines were dredging up all of this, uh, what he called uh, muck and filth. And they bore the label proudly. They said, yes, we are muckrakers. We go through this uh, to help out with slums and sanitation, children's working conditions, all that 
all that stuff that we talked about with yellow journalism. Um, there was a very famous, infamous fire, uh, the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory. Uh, remember, I, I, th I think a lot of us, if you're like me, a lot of people think of factories as building automobiles or airplanes or washing machines or something like that. But a lot of factories um, do um, clothing and shirts and, uh, and shoes and things like that. Not big, giant industrial items, but uh, uh, sewing and so on. Um, and um, kids and women tend to be the workers in those kinds of factories. My wife, as a side point, my wife is Thai, and uh, she, at the age of uh, 12 or 13, left the farm in the northeast of the country, and she went to Bangkok to work in a factory, and she did sewing and things like that. So since then, she got her high school equivalency and went off to college, but it, this is something that is still with us uh, today, uh, women and children uh, working in factories and things, and they have uh, small hands and things and can do some of this delicate work uh, like sewing and sewing machines and all of that. So at the Triangle Shirtwaist Factory back to America in uh, New York City, um, uh, a lot of the women were immigrants and the uh, owners didn't trust them. They thought maybe they'd be stealing. I don't know what thread or needles or something. They thought they'd be stealing. So they locked all of the exit doors. And when a fire broke out, they couldn't get out the exits. Uh, and many of them died. Um, generally, when people die in a fire, it's smoke inhalation. People are rarely uh, burned by fire to death. It's mostly smoke and uh, that sort of thing. Not quite as grisly, but still it's awful. Um, and uh, a very, very similar uh, tragic factory fire happened just a couple of years ago in uh, Bangladesh. Uh, they m make uh, uh, lots of clothes, t-shirts, uh, uh, shirts, and things like that. And again, the same thing. They weren't immigrants, of course, uh, but the owners thought, uh, we can't trust these people and they blocked many of the exit doors and things because they thought they'd be stealing and many people died uh, just recently, not more than just three, four, five years ago, something like that. So that's the sort of thing that the muckrakers um, uh, went through and brought to the public's attention. I always think of uh, investigative journalists and muckrakers in the news as that the world is kind of a dim twilight sort of a place and they have a big bright light and they can take that big bright light and shine it into the dark corners and uh, so that we can see it right it might be uh, government corruption it might be bad drinking water uh, maybe like in Flint um, or uh, or whatnot and um, and they shine that bright light so that we can all sort of look at it and, and see it in the, in the light of day and that's kind of how I think of, uh, of good journalism, whether it's uh, newspapers or magazines or, or, uh, or whatever. And uh, they bring those sorts of things uh, to us all, calling attention to it. And then, of course, when we uh, learn of these um, pr problems, uh, we can contact our representatives in Congress and stuff and demand action. So that's kind of how it works, right? The newspapers can call attention to various uh, problems, and uh, as a population, we can vote for people or call attention or write letters to our, our uh, representatives until there is change. Okay, so uh, we have a uh, more general interest magazines uh, coming off of the uh, Saturday Evening Post. And general interest magazines, they are sort of like uh, broadcast television, and we're going to get up to television in a little bit, but the first television networks were a little bit of everything, just like these general interest magazines were a little bit of everything, and kind of for the whole family. Uh, television could have uh, children's shows in the afternoon, and soap operas, and news, and comedy, and dramas, a little bit for everybody in the family, and um, they are kind of emulating um, magazines in that way. Uh, they're kind of emulating the Saturday Evening Post, a little bit of news and some features and some comedy and some, and some stories and so on. And here's another one, the Reader's Digest. 
They took stories from other uh, magazines, Wichita Eagle and uh, so on. Here's a, This is much more recent from 2017, taking stories from online and uh, digesting the stories for the readers, um, kind of like a news feed, really, right? They're taking all the best stories that they could find. Uh, they've been around for 90 uh, years or so. And that's the Reader's Digest. Another general interest uh, news magazine is Time, and they came out in the 1920s and uh, helped interpret the news through the 1930s with, uh, with uh, what was going on in Europe, Hitler and the Nazis, the Far East, Asia, and all of that. And uh, they are still around, getting your, uh, getting your uh, uh, picture on the cover of Time magazine is kind of a big deal. It's a weekly magazine. And their yearly, uh, man it was Man of the Year until recently when it became Person of the Year. And they have actually also done um, uh, things like um, uh, uh, topics, uh, topics like uh, uh, global warming and things like that, uh, as well as just people, and sometimes groups of people. I think at one point they named um, teenagers as people or persons of the year, so sometimes it's a group. I think uh, Greta Thunberg uh, was named uh, this past year uh, representing glo global warming and young people and, and, and so on. Uh, anyway, here's Martin Luther King. Uh, back in 19, I can't see, it's kind of blurry, I think it's about 1966 uh, or so, 64, 63, uh, civil rights leader as a uh, man of the year. And part of that same uh, news uh, conglomerate, Time, is Life magazine. Time Life is the name of the corporation. And... Uh, they have another, there's another publication, not, not under the same ownership, called Look Magazine, but they're both uh, large-sized, um, uh, maybe uh, uh, maybe 14 inches high, uh, very big, and uh, this is a premier place if you are a photojournalist. This is a real honor to get your uh, photographs and things in uh, Life Magazine or Look Magazine. National Geographic would be another honor, I, I would think, uh, if you can get your, your, your pictures in there. But Life Magazine, again, general interest, so they might have some uh, showbiz stuff. There's Marilyn Monroe on the cover back in 1952. Uh, they did the, the space program in a lot of depth in the 1960s with astronauts and moon launches and all that kind of stuff. Um, and uh, so a little bit of news, entertainment. Um, and, and, and stories and things like that, art. There was a whole magazine uh, uh, issue on Picasso and things like that. So kind of general interest, like, a, again, like television ended up uh, uh, emulating. They have a pass-along readership, so it's, it's so general interest that the whole family can read it, grandma, mom, dad, and so on. Um, like uh, many of you, my, uh, one set of my grandparents were immigrants, um, and uh, my grandparents came from Czechoslovakia, uh, Eastern Europe, in a great tide uh, in the early uh, 1900s, and we have always had waves and waves of immigration and things like that. We're a nation of immigrants. And my grandmother uh, didn't learn English very well, um, but my, uh, my Mother and her sisters always got, got Grandma a subscription to Life magazine because she could uh, look at the pictures and sort of understand the news and so on. This is uh, before uh, television became commonplace. Um, but uh, this is kind of a personal story. Um, I read it as a kid. Um, life has sort of gone away since. Now they have special uh, issues on uh, the year in pictures or on uh, uh, the Beatles or, uh, or uh, th things like that. Um, uh, but they're not a weekly uh, magazine anymore, sad to say. Oh, that's nice. There is a case for interplanetary saucers. Okay. <laughs> oh, very nice. Okay. 1970s, we get new special interest magazines. Here's a couple. There are magazines for cats and cigars, surfing, 
uh, snowboarding, skiing, knitting, um, Civil War history. There are a lot of magazines out there, really a lot. And you were going to ask me how many, and we're going to get to that. I'm going to, we're going to talk about how many are actually out there in just a little bit. But uh, this is kind of um, the uh, direction that cable TV took narrowing its focus. And so cable TV started with uh, uh, narrow focus things like an all news channel, an all weather channel, an all music channel channel and all sports channel and even uh, being more specific and all uh, a tennis channel and things like that so cable TV started uh, like that too F fairly general interest and then getting more and more narrow in its focus and more specific so we, we see the different medias um, learning and copying from each other This is Vogue magazine, and people, if something was very stylish, people used to say, oh, that's in Vogue. Oh, those, those dresses are in Vogue. And it kind of took on a, a secondary meaning, but it actually first meant that it was in the magazine, Vogue. And um, so we have special interest magazines. And I know a lot of us, we go through, uh, we like to stream um, uh, we like to stream uh, from Netflix or Amazon and things because we don't like all of those ads that are on broadcast TV and with uh, music. We, we like uh, streaming and maybe we even pay a little bit of extra so we don't have to listen to ads. And you might think that we really don't like advertising, but we really do. We really do like advertising. We just don't really like advertising that uh, doesn't apply to us. But if you are interested in fashion, and you pick up an issue of Vogue, or if you're interested in snowboarding, uh, then all the ads are about the, the latest fashions, or the latest waxes, or the latest uh, wheels for your, for your skateboard, or the latest um, cigars. If you're interested in scuba diving, great places to dive. And for those kinds of magazines, the ads are really the best part. The, the, that's, that's half why we, people buy uh, some of those magazines, right? To go through and see the latest dresses and styles and all that. So I know a lot of us uh, don't think positively about ads and advertising, but uh, if we sort of dig down a little bit, um, a lot of the advertising we do like. And think about seeing trailers for new movies coming out. Okay, the new trailer for the new whatever Harry Potter, Avengers, James Bond movie, right? That's an ad. Trailers are ads, and we love those. So uh, I just want to uh, to sort of point out that we don't really hate advertising uh, for, I don't know, adult uh, uh, adult uh, uh, diapers and things like that and headache medicine and all that kind of stuff because they're not really aimed at us. But if it's a, if it's a well-targeted ad uh, aimed at us, then it's really quite interesting. So uh, Time, Life, Sports Illustrated, and People and Entertainment Weekly, they're all owned by one big company. They've been sold and sold again and sold again. There used to be a, a, a company that owned all that. I think they've been sold off and sold off, but uh, they really are uh, kind of the heart of uh, big mass media magazines and things. Every, I think everybody knows these magazines. They're all pretty famous. And uh, just a couple there. Oh, that's an autograph one. How nice. Uh, so here's a couple of recent ones from the Time Life Empire. Playboy and National Geographic are collected. And uh, I have to say, um, whether it's National Geographic or Playboy or Life or whatever, um, collecting magazines is kind of fun because it's kind of a, a, a time capsule. Um, I've got magazines that are 10, 20, 30 years old. And, um, and you look back at them and you see the stories and you see the technology and you see the ads. Uh, and they're really a lot of fun. They're really, it's really a lot of fun to see. We don't really have that with the internet. It's hard to look at uh, the internet from 20 years ago, right? Because it's constantly changing and updating. Uh, but with the magazine, in particular, um, you can, they don't take up a lot of room, and uh, they are a fun time capsule to look back and see what kinds of technology. Playboy, in particular, is aimed at men, and uh, in uh, early Playboy's uh, that I have seen from the 1960s. It's fun to see the kind of technology 
uh, a lot of the ads are for turntables and stereo receivers and uh, eight millimeter film cameras and all that kind of technology. Today, of course, it would be, it would be uh, phones and computers and tablets and things. Uh, but looking at the kinds of ads that they had in Playboy, again, aimed mostly at men, young men, uh, we see lots of um, audio, uh, lots of audio technology and things, like I say, stereos and stereo receivers and speakers and, and uh, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of fun. And the prices, of course, too, are fun to see what they were. Uh, this is a rather famous uh, cover here from National Geographic, this uh, Afghani uh, woman with those uh, striking green eyes, uh, a, a refugee, and this is from uh, 1985. She was tracked down. She's still alive. At least she was three or four years ago. Tracked down, and they put her on the cover um, 25, 30 years later. I guess it would be 30, 35 years later. She, of course, she's now middle-aged and so on, but her uh, beautiful green eyes are still very uh, striking looking really right into you. That, that's, that's really an amazing picture. I just love that. The gold standard in magazines is the New Yorker magazine. They uh, have a, a very qualified staff. They are especially known for their uh, research. So when they print something, it will have been fact-checked to death. Uh, and it, they very rarely have to make corrections, very rarely. Um, and um, it costs a lot of money to hire all of those fact checkers and things. Um, but uh, it really is a fantastic magazine. Uh, I mentioned earlier about uh, uh, the New York Times and some of these other things. And as uh, a young college student, hopefully someday you will be running things. You'll be in charge of something. Okay, we all start out young students and things, but eventually you might work at a store and become the manager and start running things and become a supervisor and so on and so forth, maybe go into political office, who knows what. And so if you are going to run the world someday, then you want to read uh, and listen to the media of the world leaders, right? The people that run things. And uh, those periodicals, New York Times and New Yorker and LA Times and stuff, those are the things that people who run our lives, read. So think about it. Okay, so we we're talking about how many uh, magazines there are. This is a typical Barnes and Noble store. Sadly, many bookstores are uh, uh, gone. There are a few independent ones, and I think this is the only chain. Um, so uh, profits come from ads and subscriptions, like you think, like you, you know, what, how else? And um, most magazines have about 50% are made up of advertising and about 50% are made up of articles. About 50% made up of articles. So that's what you see if you open up a typical magazine, about half and half. Now, we certainly don't have half of our television programs as commercials or half of our radio programs as commercials, but magazines can do that because all you gotta do is turn the page, right? You can stop and read it if you're interested or turn the page. So they have a much higher uh, ratio of uh, ad to editorial copy. There are 20,000 magazines in the US today, but only 100 have a circulation of over 1 million. Now remember, there are 320 million uh, Americans and uh, so only 100 have a circulation over a million, like Time and, and, and so on, and Newsweek and people. Um, and there are lots of magazines. Uh, you know, there's the New England Journal of Medicine, and there's the Microbiology one, and there's the Physics one, and all sorts of high-tech specialty ones. There are magazines on every uh, airplane uh, that you go to. Every college has a magazine, right? Every college has a magazine. There are magazines all over the place. Everywhere you go, some are free and and so on. Uh, there, but there are twenty thousand. That's a pretty big number. And I've been to a couple of Barnes and Nobles, and I kept seeing these giant racks, three racks high, that go through the entire, usually the entire back of the store. And so I counted. 
I decided to count. There's a section right there, and I counted one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, and seven more, and seven more, and seven more, and so on, and totaled it all up for each section, and then multiplied one, two, three, 12, or 14 sections. Okay, I didn't count every single magazine, but I did some extrapolating. And it came up with 1,400 magazines. 1,400, that's really something. It's really something. And that's just an average, right? And you can go into any good-sized uh, bookstore, and, and you have quite a choice. And smart home, uh, photo, this is the photo art section here. Um, it's kind of hard to, there's Mad Magazine, Mad Magazine, good old Mad Magazine. I think they just went out, and here's some celebrity magazines, entertainment, and so on, current events, men's interests, ladies' interests, all that uh, kind of stuff. I love browsing through a good magazine rack. Circulation is the term for the readership numbers. What is the circulation? And there it is in italics. Okay, that means it's probably going to show up somewhere, maybe on a test, something like that. Who knows? But that is the term. Magazines, readership numbers. And like we know, there's also pass along uh, readership. Um, you know, if you're the only one in the family that's interested in cigars or snowboarding, then it's not going to get passed around very much. But if it's a general interest magazine like Time or Entertainment Weekly or Sports Illustrated, then maybe the whole family is going to pass it around and read it. And that makes the ads uh, more expensive, right? Because they know more people are going to read it, not just the one person that has subscribed to it. So as we come up to the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, we have what was called the new journalism. And in that, the reporter becomes part of the story. Um, maybe they go skydiving. Who knows what, right? They're going to learn what this is all about. Uh, there was some uh, uh, articles uh, written for Sports Illustrated by George Plimpton, and he uh, wrote one. He, he did a whole book called Paper Plimpton, and he, or Paper Tiger, Paper Tiger, something like that. He 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 joined no Paper Lion. Sorry, he he was allowed to go through training camp with the Detroit Lions, and he wrote about his experiences. Today, it's very common for reporters to sort of participate and dive in and see what it's all about. But anyway, this began uh, in uh, uh, in earnest uh, back in the late '60s uh, with a couple of magazine journalists, Hunter S. Thompson at Rolling Stone and uh, Tom Wolfe and uh, um, Hunter Thompson at Rolling Stone. Of course, their readership is a little bit different, much younger, sort of a rock and roll readership. And he wrote about um, uh, drugs and politics and the Kentucky Derby, all sorts of stuff in a very personal style, very crazy, almost stream of conscious uh, style of writing. And they were gathered together uh, into a book, Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. He also did Fear and Loathing on the Campaign Trail in 1972 uh, with uh, Richard Nixon and George McGovern, turned into a book, uh, The Great Shark Hunt. Lots of his books are uh, compilations of his uh, articles and things. But this one was turned into a movie starring Johnny Depp, and I have linked to the trailer for the film. Hunter Thompson was a notorious drug user, uh, LSD, mescaline, alcohol, cocaine, I don't know, all that stuff. Uh, probably not exaggerated by very much. Um, and uh, uh, it's all evident in the film. Johnny Depp does a great job. Johnny was very uh, interested. He was a fan of Hunter Thompson's. He, apparently he uh, went, visited and stayed at his place for a few weeks and sort of watching him and and learning his uh, mannerisms and his vocal style and all that. He does a pretty good job. It's weird to see Johnny Depp bald, but Hunter Thompson didn't have much hair on top, and so Johnny shaved his head and, and did Hunter Thompson in uh, the film, uh, directed by Terry Gilliam uh, of Monty Python fame. You can watch that film for extra credit. Okay, so you watch it, write about a half a page or thereabouts. There is a place... Uh, I hope to upload it, so um, you might check that out. There's uh, Hunter, 
Malo and Johnny and Benicio Del Toro above from the film. Okay. And the other new journalists of note, there are many, there are quite a few actually, but uh, these are the two, Tom Wolf, and he wrote the electric Kool-Aid acid test, and acid tests being uh, um, what uh, Ken Kesey and his Merry Pranksters were doing back in 1965 and 66 and 67, and uh, um, putting LSD in Kool-Aid and things like that, and, and working with the Grateful Dead, and they traveled around the country in this giant 19, what is it, I think it was a 1936 International Harvester uh, bus that they retrofitted and you can ride around on top and perform live music, all that crazy kind of stuff. Um, and so Tom Wolfe uh, rode around and wrote about it, right, part of, as part of the new journalism. And uh, there it is. I don't know if that's the original or not, but kind of cool. It's around somewhere. So roped off for the tourists. Latest trend is online only, of course, right? So this is electronic media, and uh, all the magazines, of course, Time and Life and National Geographic and Sports Illustrated, they all have an online edition. Um, I still like a regular good old uh, print edition. Magazines are just fun to sit there and, uh, and thumb through. Lots of, they, they have uh, usually um, nice design layout, lots of pictures, things like that. They're in waiting rooms and offices, so if you don't have your phone and you can't go thumbing through your phone. You can grab a magazine and go thumbing through it. They're an impulse buy at supermarkets. Right there at the checkout stand, you can grab the latest issue of whatever in a lot of cases. Um, but uh, we have some online only magazines. They are not print in any way. And that is Slate and Salon. Here are some uh, you know, uh, front pages, so, so to speak, of, of the two online magazines, and they look like a regular magazine. They look uh, just like uh, you might expect, you know, a regular magazine with uh, pictures and the print and the title and, and all that uh, sort of stuff. Uh, but they are online only, but they're, they're quite good. There are lots of magazines, and, and some are aggregators and some aren't, uh, but they are uh, online. And ag aggregation, um, I believe we talked about this with uh, newspapers, uh, but that is a big problem. And um, a lot of our news feeds are aggregators and, um, and they sort of borrow the news and that is hurting uh, the news industry, whether they're aggregating uh, uh, magazine stories or uh, newspaper stories and collecting them all and maybe not paying for it. So that is a big problem in the print world, um, people just sort of grabbing uh, the, the magazine story or the newspaper story, putting it on their site. Um, unless there's a paywall, uh, we get these aggregated stories uh, for free. And um, as I mentioned uh, last class, um, if you can, if you, if you get some disposable income sometime, you might subscribe uh, to a magazine or a newspaper. Um, at mitigating the uh, circumstances of uh, all the aggregation uh, that goes on from uh, the Google News Feeds and, uh, and uh, Huffington Post and, and all of that. Um, yeah. Journalists gotta pay the rent, pay the mortgage, feed the families, just like everybody else does. Uh, and musicians too, for that matter, right? Musicians, it's hard to be a musician unless you're Unless you're uh, Taylor or Beyonce or Kanye or somebody or Jay-Z, it's hard to make a living uh, as a musician. So again, this is kind of a continuing theme that we have in our class that, uh, that all of this electronic media is a big disruptor. Um, a lot of people don't want to pay for anything, and I understand that, but um, that is a hard uh, business model for uh, artists and musicians and journalists and so on, the sort of aggregation of, uh, of the resources and getting things for, for free. So um, again, something that will be tracking us 
through the semester. In the meantime, uh, that is it for our second class on magazines. And uh, for our next class, we're going to move into the uh, uh, motion pictures, history of motion pictures, the business and the art and the technology of motion pictures, 125 years of uh, motion picture history and technology. So that will take us, I think, three classes. It's a big topic. Television is a big topic. That's going to take us three or four classes to um, uh, so that will be our, uh, our next topic for a number of weeks. And until then, thank you so much for joining me. Let me find uh, the off switch here. There we go. Okay, take care until next time.